Well, we are here to begin the vlog for Friday, uh, December 11th, uh, 2020. It is 6 hours and 32 minutes into the day. That means it's just about 6.30 in the morning. And it's a natural start, sort of, uh, because... It's apparent now that the, that the meditation meditation is, is just basically, basically means to think about things, to focus on things. And typically, you're, you're meditating, you're thinking about, in many ways, the nature of existence and how we exist and the intertwining between theology, philosophy, and history. And how a large chunk of what goes on in history, including what we're seeing today uh, sits within the long, they talk about social engineering. Well, this has been going on for a long time. These The theories that are being proposed are not new theories, and not new ideas. Uh, but the confusion, the level of confusion, the level, but the thing at the same time, the level of certainty being put forward by some of these leaders is basically foolish. It's... Uh, an indication of of uh, moron of, of 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 a moronic mind, where they cannot think past a certain point that they become crippled. They cannot do the analysis that they need to do in order to understand that this is a bad idea. That this that a lot of people are going to be hurt. In many cases, they think get, having people being hurt and eliminating them you know, to cleanse the gene pool, that this is a good thing. You know, it's, oh, no, we're cleaning the gene pool, that we're, we're cleansing the earth. And this is what you'll hear, you how, how we're, they're cleansing the earth, it's a great reset. And they're proud of the great reset. Even though they're hurting millions of people, they don't care. They think they're doing something wonderful, something great. We can now understand how to, how to, you ask the question, well, how does, an entire population of Germany, and of course then in France as well, and all the areas that go into Poland, how do they take these people in terms of these, you know, the bureaucrats, the apparatchik, how do you take them and tell them, oh, you know, we're going to start shipping these people out to these death camps? You tell them it's a good idea. And the thing is, this is something that's worked up to, that where, where you come in, you take over, and people are happy about it in some cases because, well, they have the same ideas that you do. That certain people need to be gotten rid of in order to clean the clean up the gene pool, in order to improve things. So what happened is the top scientists and doctors were encouraging what was going on because, well, this is how you improve society. This is how you do social engineering. And the final solution, Auschwitz and, and so on and so forth, was part of the social engineering plan. And its title was eugenics. And it's still here today. This is what we're seeing now. This is what everyone's so afraid of in terms of the vaccine. They're afraid of the eugenics factor. Because uh, uh, Bill Gates and George Soros and a number of these other people are all people who believe in eugenics. And George Soros has a history of this. He goes. He, he has ties to the Nazi Party, and the thing is, it wasn't the Nazi Party. It wasn't just simply one thing, or restricted simply to Germans. There was a number of people who really had an affinity for the Nazi idea of cleansing the environment. And what they mean by cleansing the environment, that, that there were people who were defective, and in order to get rid of these defective genes, you had to get rid of these people. It's just simple common sense to them that, that you know okay uh, these people are genetically defective you have in order to get rid of rid of them in order in terms of cleaning up society in terms of cleansing the earth and re resolving the social problems well then you have to get rid of these people there's no other option these people are in pain they're suffering they're not living well uh so out they go and you have even Protestants who are involved in this. And so it, it, it crosses religion. It's not simply these are atheists believing this. There are a lot of them who are Christians and and all all forms of these different things, you know, all forms of religion have this set, what we call 
it calls a delineation of society where they talk about uh, I'm not necessarily talking about class structure but mm, class structure in the sense of enlightenment and entitlement there were always the rich there were always the aristocracy but then there was also the priestly classes. The priestly classes were the, the academics, if you will. And all these different religions had this delineation. They had people who, including, you had people who were the untouchables. This is what we see in India. We talk about the caste system. The number of religions, including Roman Catholicism, that have a caste system is without parallel. And the thing is, a large chunk of what we're seeing today when we talk about racism and you know, about this misogyny and all these different things, these are all results of a caste system. And this caste system goes even into um, uh, 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 socialism, which is, again, a social construct. But what's the social construct about? It's about where people are in society in terms of their natural environment. And unfortunately, uh, when they created these terms in terms of the intellectual standard, that's what we talk about today, they talk about the education class, the, 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 the people who were educated. But the thing is, these people who were educated are not necessarily on the upper levels. They're simply being told they're at the upper levels. But really, they're still within what we call the minion class. The minion class are not part of the elite. They may believe they're part of the elite. They're, in many cases, they're sold and told that they're part of the elite. But they never really are part of the elite. They're sort of kind of, you know, there are there are tricks going on to create the illusion that they are part of the elite, but really they're not. And this is how you get a lot of academics sucked into a large chunk of the social environment, this, uh, the, the social understanding of things, and call it social justice. And what is social justice about? Well, in their initial, initial contact, and in their initial development, they created standards of... of, of of people who were uh, sufficiently deficient that they needed people to take care of them, uh, they weren't able to take care of themselves. These were the morons. These were the this was these were idiots. Uh, these are all full proper terms uh, within uh, the scientific community in terms of uh, the social engineering. This is what it was from the 1930s, and women were classified as a, as a form of of imbecile or idiot or moron they're classified in there as feebly minded and so they needed somebody to take care of them and of course it can't be a woman taking care of them because why well because women are feebly minded it has to be a man and a man is not feebly minded and they would believe this stuff was genetic and you had all these top scientists and top doctors supporting this and so this is what leads into in, into the society. You had your top doctors, you, who were all men, you couldn't have women as the top doctor. Why? Because they were feebly minded. And they created this environment where they believed their own rhetoric. And as this continues on, it kept going more and more. And this is how you end up with with people who would call them good people, they were average people, sending people to death camps because they believed that these people were being helped. That this was a good thing to do. They didn't see the evil of it. They didn't see that this was something bad. They saw it as something good. And we're doing the same thing today. We see what's happening now. The feminists are being replaced by the transgendered people. Feminism is passe. It's now trans. You don't need uh, female athletes anymore because the, the trans athletes do much better than the female, the biological females. They do much better and they create a sense of equality. This is, you want to get your equality up there? You want to have uh, uh, women uh, competing on par with men? Well, the trans woman can do it. The, the female can't do it. The real female, the, the bi biological female can't do it. But a trans woman can. But do you ever dare speak against a trans person? Look at what uh, uh, the, the author of... Uh, uh, of uh, Harry Potter's gone through. Uh, any feminist has stood up and said the feminist first and argued against the trans were shot down. Their books weren't published or they lost their money. They, they, a large chunk of people have turned against them. 
Not because they understand what's going on, but because this is what everybody else is doing. They're following along. They're following the herd. And you see, and you see it on the right. You see with the religious following a particular uh, religious dictate or a religious understanding. This this is the people who follow the Talmud. This is the people who follow uh, a particular guru. These are the people who follow uh, a particular fatwa from, from, from Islam. Uh, it's all over the place. The people who look at the number of people who believe in the Pope, right? The Protestant Church itself forms from the from the from the from the understanding of the sheep, of the herd, of the flock. It's the fear of God. This is how they operate. They operate based on the strict mandate of establishment. The establishment establishment is going to protect you from the wrath of God. They're going to tell you how to properly behave in order to avoid the wrath of God. Get rid of that, you have the Marxists, who say, well, there's no more God. Well, what do you have? You have Anna Freud. Anna Freud is going to tell you how to behave normal. And that's what they did from, from, from FDR on, up until the 1960s, the whole dictate of the United States and most of the world, the Western world, the educated world, was Anna Freud. Your marketing and PR was Edward Bernays, the, the nephew of uh, Sigmund Freud. So we, we're, we're still, in many ways, we're still living in a Freudian era. The shift that has come in lately is something that came out of uh, Timothy Leary and Ram Dass. But it still goes back to the whole Freudian thing of creating an establishment that they have an established order that must be adhered to or there are serious penalties and, and, and consequences. This is Cynthia Johnson standing up as a as a, a supposed Baptist preacher and giving a lecture, giving a, a, a fire and brimstone speech to do respect from, from a Bible thumper. And what she's doing, she's calling, calling the forces of anti-establishment to attack those who dare challenge the authority of the Democrats. So you have, again, even though this is from Timothy Leary, this is from Ram Dass in terms of the, the, the understanding, you're moving back to the Freudian establishment. And this is what the reality of the situation is, but most people not, aren't going to see this. They're not going to understand what's going on. And so this comes to me as, as I'm dreaming, I dream about these different things, and this is part of the meditation. This is how you see things. You see things interconnect. And they, inter they interconnect with the gospel. And you see that Christ rejects all of this. He says, it doesn't matter about status. Status doesn't matter. And this is why you see him as the Good Samaritan, because the Good Samaritan, the Samaritans were uh, untouchable. They were untouchable by the Jews. They weren't kosher. So they were an untouchable class. They were an untouchable caste. Yet here you have Christ being the untouchable. And what's the final judgment? That you do to the least of men, you do to me. Christ and God identifying with the lowest person on earth. Christ identifying with people like Epstein. And you see it again in the publican and the Pharisee. You see it there again in, in, in the... Uh, uh, the, the, the parable of the prodigal son. It's there. But in many cases, we choose not to see it. In many cases, in, for many cases as well, it's not seen at all. Maybe we just don't have the capacity to see this. It really depends on how deeply you're, in, you're, you're, you're sucked into the narrative of the day or, or, or even sort of the, so the, the Freudian environment. If you're part of that Freudian establishment, it's very difficult to break free from it because you're trained in this way. This is the school system. The school system is extremely Freudian. It is not Christian. It is not parochial or whatever. It's Freudian. And this was done under FDR. Anyways, uh, this is the nature of what we do. So, this is what I... This is cyborg This is cybernetics. This is uh, a number of the research that goes on here. And so... This is part of the discussion. This is part of the conversation. And uh, onward and upward, I guess. <laughs> There's the bus.
Well, it was the 12th, it's Saturday, uh, Friday, uh, is still operating in terms of, uh, the vlog, we're gonna end the vlog for Friday. As I said, we run on a 24-hour day, so it's typically we, uh, start on Friday and uh, end on Saturday, you know, start on one day, end on the next day, uh, because it's continuous, uh, the, my sleep research desk did very well, t uh, today, it was, it was broken up, it's, it, it, this is what typically happens, it's never a straight through, uh, event. And so I get up and I do things in between. And being a a, a lucid dreamer, it's like being awake. It, it, there is, in terms of the mental awareness, there is no uh, sleep, actually. You're aware of what's going on in terms of the environment that you're in. You're aware of the motions that you're, that, are, that are going on, and sometimes you're even aware of some of the physical uh, realities that are going on. There is an interplay between uh, what you're dreaming in terms of and, and what you're feeling physically. There is uh, there is an interplay between the two. Uh, what that is exactly, I don't know exactly. I don't yet. I have a camera that will, will watch me while I'm sleeping that will record uh, footage, but. Uh, That's one of the projects that uh, has to be done. So uh, we're going to kind of have to sort of see how that ends up working out. And there's still some issues that I'm not too sure about. And the thing is, the, the, this project, this sleep research project, is a long-term one. It's not uh, something short-term. And it's going to take uh, a, a significant amount of time in order to get through all the things I need to get through. So it's, it's, it's going to be uh, a bit of an issue. So... Uh, this is kind of how things work. It, there are short-term short projects and then there are long-term projects. Uh, and the music room, the, 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 the laptop there, the Linux laptop, uh, is, a is turned into a long-term product because it needs a lot more work than, uh, initially anticipated. Uh, but it is possible, but it, it, it there's an enormous amount of steps that I have to go through and there's not everything is exactly set up yet, so... I do have to sit down and start working through some of these issues that kind of pop up from now again, uh, from every now every now and again. And I see people that that you know going back to this whole uh, where we are in, in the situation is that the the global situation is that we're in a really tight spot. Um, a lot of nasty things have been done. And uh, there are a lot of people who just simply don't understand the realities of what's happening, particularly even the people who were supporting, supposedly supporting Trump. They're all over the place. They, they, you say, well, the Trump supporter is a one particular thing, one type, particular type of person, and they're not. Uh, they're all over the place. They didn't really have a specific issue other than they were going to support Trump. And then this is kind of work, it works kind of the opposite way around. You had a lot of people who didn't like Trump who supported Biden. Why did they support Biden? Because they simply just didn't like Trump. So a lot of cases, and, and if on the both sides, you have people who just simply chose because they didn't like the other person. Uh, and for no other particular reason, if you sit down and ask them the questions specifically, why don't you like, you know, what, where are the particular issues? Uh, there are people who could answer where the particular issues are, who understood what was going on, but the, the, those were the minority. The minority were, were, were the ones who actually understood what was going on, where the issues lay. The majority of the people that I spoke to and I've seen on the internet and so on and so forth, uh, it was a personality issue. And a lot of times these fights often end up, even this whole thing over... Let's call it chronic gas. You know, the Great Fart Panic of 2020. It wasn't about the Great Fart Panic itself. It was about the, the, the personality surrounding the, the thing. It's, it's, it's who you were as a person that mattered, not whether or not you actually understood what was going on. It, again, you have a lot of what we call bit players, and this is where a lot of conspiracy theory comes in, and 
Uh, a lot of conspiracy theories are very, you know, in terms of a researcher, they're on a very superficial level. They're on the most, the, 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 they're on the highest level because they're very shallow. You have to go very deep in order to get in, to get into any significant amount of research, and to have a good understanding. But most uh, conspiracy theories, they're weekend warriors. They're there after work, or you know, they're they're at their leisurely time. This is part of their part of their their amusement, part of their enjoyment is to do these things, and they they don't take the time to really go in depth, and they take the assumption that they know what's going on because. They've read an article here, they've read an article there, and, and, and it's based on these articles written by journalists that they have no idea who they are. As I said, in order, one of the key research attributes that you have to do is you have to vet your sources. You have to find out, well, who, who, when you're reading something, who wrote it? Why did they write it? What was their experience? Uh, how do they get to know what they know? You know, what... What were the things in their life that sort of shifted their path and sort of, okay, I'm understanding this. What led them to believe this or understand what they're, what they're understanding you know, in, terms of, in terms of parsing information to you? If you can't answer this, then you can't answer the basic research questions in terms of, well, not significant. And a lot of times, sources can't be, can't be vetted. There are sources that can't be vetted because there is no background source that, 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 that's identifiable. So you, what you do is you take that source, that, that, that information, you sort of put on the shelf. We leave it there. For Because if this situation is real, or whatever they're talking about is real, you'll find others who will talk about the same thing. In other words, you'll, have, you'll be able to get multiple sources. And within the multiple sources, you'll be able to find one or two people, maybe, that will lead you back to more significant sources. In other words, you'll have a trail. But not, until you have that trail and enough multiple sources, enough of the multiple sources, you really can't make a determination. You say, okay, I've got this here, and this is one case I know, uh, the, the, the conspiracy theory that, uh, you know, the, the Jesuits sank the Titanic. And you hear it again and again and again. Tons of people talk about how the Jesuits sank the Titanic. And it's goes, yeah, because most of the sources that I've seen about sinking the Jesuits sinking the Titanic didn't say anything why the Jesuits were the son of the Titanic. What, what was the, the sort of the motive for this? Uh, just going on some of the views that they had about Jesuits. It's not until you until you go into the further and sort of get a history of the Jesuits and some of the uh, the information came from a variety of different places, uh, multiple sources. They begin to realize what the motive would be would have been. But the thing is, even then you didn't have necessarily. Okay, well, where's my other proof? Watching another show, a documentary that uh, it was a leisurely thing. It was a, it was a travel log that talked about different, different things, and they brought up a letter written by a Jesuit who was supposedly on board the Titanic. This is a second independent source. As long as you start having well, one or more independent sources, you've got something. No, I should say two or more independent sources. You've got something. But until then, you don't have anything. And the second independent source was significant to say something's up, that there might be some truth of this uh, thing that the Jesuits sunk the Titanic. Because I've got a motive, and now I've got uh, circumstantial evidence from a second source uh, that uh, leads this to be uh, leads this to a larger indication that the Jesuits did indeed sink the Titanic. That it was deliberate, was it wasn't an accident. But the thing is, again, that's all the, the tiny pieces that I have. And in terms of in terms of what I can release, I do have more, but I can't release it. So some of the information has to be held back. Anyways, uh, that's it for uh, uh, third, uh, Friday and into Saturday morning. Uh, I'll probably be vlogging more at my parents' house, so I'll take one of these uh, these uh, devices here and vlog there because, uh, well, I'm going for the weekend. <laughs>